Hey everyone, one spitting here. So obviously I've not been posting a lot of videos to the channel lately. Um, no great reason why. I've just kind of been doing other stuff. Been having a lot of fun playing games lately and not taking pictures and not having to worry about doing a battle report afterward. Uh, my plan for the time being is to only do reports uh, when there are tournaments. Although I have been talking with people lately about trying to get some local players to do like um, instead of a one-day tournament, maybe one-day mini campaign. So there might be some themed games. If it's something like that, I might do some battle reports on it. But what I want to do today, um, uh, no huge purpose. I, I posted on my Facebook page asking for suggestions for philosophical ramblings. A, a former clubmate and good friend of mine, Todd Wyatt, uh, posted a, a suggestion, which isn't really philosophical rambling, so I'm not uh, going to put this in that playlist, but just a, kind of a hobby-related uh, topic around uh, how should we score tournaments and uh, paint scores and stuff like that. And um, yeah, I, 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 I kind of live a lot within the tournament world and um, uh, a little bit behind the scenes running tournaments uh, or at least talking about other tournaments. And uh, I thought that might be something worth addressing, not because I think I have any great answers. I certainly have some ideas, some things to think about. Uh, I'm really hoping people will uh, post comments and maybe open my eyes to things that that we don't do locally or that I haven't thought about. Um, and maybe I can uh, post a follow-up video to this with some, uh, maybe some suggestions, things that, you know, conclusions that I come to. So to start off with, um, I should probably talk about how we do things here in the, the, uh, the mid-Atlantic region. So let's see, tournaments. We have a um, best overall first, second, and third place. And best overall is determined by uh, battle points primarily, uh, secondarily uh, painting scores, and then sportsmanship scores. And I'll, I'll talk um, about more specifics uh, later. later. Uh, another thing that we do, have been doing a lot lately at most of our local tournaments, is doing best in race awards. Now, um, well, let me see, I'm sorry. So there's there's best overall, then there's best general first through third place, then there's best painted first through third place. Then there's best sportsmanship first through third place. And and right off the bat, we have 12 awards. And then we do a best in race. So there's another dozen plus awards, depending on if any armies are not represented. Um, and that's just how we do it. I like I, I might talk about some, some positive and negatives uh, doing it that way. But that's just, I mean, it's we do that so much. Very There's very little variation uh, among the different tournaments. Um, I can tell you, uh, one thing I like, I, you know, our tournaments are usually, I mean, if with ninth age, just getting off the ground last year, we had some 20, 25 person GTs, but a lot of our tournaments, I would expect at least have 40 or 60 at the heyday of Warhammer fantasy eighth edition. A few years ago, we were getting over a hundred. Um, and so of course, of course, the number of people you have coming to your tournament affects how many awards you give and all that kind of stuff. Another thing we do, the uh, the story we play all of our GTs locally, Atomic Empire, has just a fantastic online store. Um, and they have a fantastic physical store, too. You, you, there's so many things to choose from to buy in there. You can usually find stuff that you want to buy, but, you know, the, almost anything else you want, you can get their, you know, via their online stuff, and then they'll just you can just pick it up at the store. So I say that because the way we do it is we take um, all of the entry fees and give it to the store, and then the store turns around, I say all, most of them, uh, entry fees, they turn around and give us um, little credit card looking things with store credit. So if you win any of those 12 awards, first through third place for all those categories, you get a store credit. And the reason I'm making a big deal about their online presence is people who travel three hours to get here if um, you know if they want if they see stuff in the store they want to to blow their earnings now they can, but they can always just take that store credit home and go online and buy stuff later and have it shipped to them or whatever. So I, I that works well for us. I mean, lately sometimes we'll offer prizes that are just a little more cool, like maybe a battle axe for best overall, and you know I've seen swords given away like really nice swords for for, for first place best general, um, and so obviously those come out of of uh, entry fees and then we give the rest to the store but i like it because it's symbiotic i mean you know we get to use the store um they don't see us as a burden you know they see us as you know these are all just automatic sales and plus when people buy stuff a lot of times 
they buy more because they're, the exact amount of their store credit doesn't cover what they want. Um, so let me talk about some of those things, um, maybe kind of a pro and con um, tactic. So best overall, painting, sportsmanship, and battle points. Um, one small problem I see with that is when tournament, if we're using these GTs as a way of determining like who's the best in the country or whatever, and then sometimes that determines based on the region, um, you know, your placement in tournaments or winning a tournament determines, you know, whether you make your region's U.S. Masters team. Now, there is no event for 2016, so it, was, it hasn't been an issue. But if we if we do have one this year, which I hope we do, uh, that means if you're pulling it from best overall, you're you're going to get people on the team who are good, who should be good generals if they're doing well at tournaments. But they're all, if they're being buoyed up by paint scores, then you can show up to the the national championship tournament and your team not do as well because maybe some of your best generals don't have good paint scores. Um, so that can be a challenge that, that you need to wrestle, that needs to be wrestled with. Um, sometimes there can be, um, I don't know how to say this. I, I don't know if this actually happens, but I'm always careful to look at conflicts of interest. You know, do you, I think it's better to try to put people in situations where they don't have to make a difficult choice on whether to do something that may or may not be wrong, uh, you know, a wrong thing to do. Um, but, you know, if sportsmanship scores uh, affect best overall and, and you're in the running for best overall, um, like one way we do that here locally is, is you give every opponent a score of a one or a two, but you always give them a two because if you give them a one, the, the TO pulls it to the side and say, hey, what's going on? Why do you give that guy a, a one instead of a two for sportsmanship? But at the end of the tournament, you pick your two favorite opponents. And that that's, works pretty well because you're trying to get some kind of differentiation there between all five opponents. Um, but if I'm at a top table and I, my opponent in game five is a really gracious guy, we had a really good time, he would probably get one of my two top two votes. Um, you know, there's a, there's a temptation that there's because I'm like, wow, if I give this person best sports, that actually can turn around and hurt me. I mean, that could that could make him leapfrog me if we're really close at the end. Uh, or what if I'm down a few tables, but I know that my buddy is at a top table. Um, do I make sure through the through the or, or I expect he my buddy or I will be at the top tables throughout the tournament? Do I do I make sure I don't give that best opponent award to people who also may be at the top tables at the end? Um, I kind of pride myself on refusing to do that. Uh, I've had one tournament where it bumped me from third to fourth place. Um, if somebody else I found out they thought through that, I would say that's fine. That's just an extra element of strategy. I would just I feel a little bit dirty, so I don't do it. But I, I don't like situations that are that are forced me to make kind of ethical decisions, right? Um, so I don't really like that the voting part. Um, I'm not I'm not horribly against it. I just I just don't really like it. One problem with this uh, the way that we do uh, best overall and then best general and then best painted is there's kind of a kind of a hierarchy. So best overall is is the top award of the whole tournament. Um, but would you rather get second place best overall or first place best general? If they're giving out a fancy battle axe, I'd rather have first place best general. But normally the way they do it is they, they give all the best overall scores and they say, great, you're first, second, and third, and now you can't win the other awards, um, best general or best painted or anything like that. You can't win them. You, you have a better award, and we don't want the same people winning all the awards. Because if you didn't have that in place and somebody, whoever in best overall very well might win best general and there's a chance of being the top three best painted and now it's like wow we have 60 people at this tournament and one guy just walked away with 25 percent of the awards now an argument can be made maybe that is how it should be i don't know but but from a tournament organizer perspective you kind of want to spread the wealth a little bit you don't want people getting frustrated you want to feel like they have a chance to get awards at these things um so I, I always find that a dilemma. I, I think I would always rather have first place anything rather than second place something else. Um, now, a, a, a workaround is if you're the TO, you can if somebody has second place overall or, or therefore would have first place best general, you could always go up to them and say, hey, which one do you want? 
and then you just do it that way and, and that might work it's just more work uh, for you i know there i mean i have some awards in my all my awards are stored in a closet it's so funny i think it's funny because at the tournament i want these awards so badly then i get home and i'm like eh, i just stick them in a room um but i have some where I, one or two where i was third place best general and i you know for me it's a little bit hollow i'm like i wasn't third place best general i was probably sixth place best general and the top three probably were in the overall um, so there's a little bit of a problem with redundancy uh, with this. I don't I don't love it that that um, because I won one award I'm not eligible for another one. But I understand why that policy is in place, uh, and I wouldn't like it if the if the awards were set up and the score the same scores were used. You know if if battle points is worth three fourths or two thirds of your best over of your overall score, then a lot of times people are winning overall or also winning a lot of the other categories. So I get that being a problem. Um, I think there are alternatives to that. And I don't think, you know, we need to change things just to change them. But I think um, some ideas to explore. I remember in the past seeing a tournament where they had a best general. I mean, the, the, the tournament was won based on generalship, period. So you had first, second, third place. And it's what we would today call best general. It was just winner. Uh, but then they also had a, a um, first through third place best painted award. So they have first through third place uh, in generalship, first through third place in painting. And then they had the Renaissance man, or whatever it's called, Renaissance person award, um, which was, you know, what we would now call overall. But with this one, that wasn't considered the top, award. or maybe it was or not, I don't know, but it was only one person. They didn't have a first through third. And I thought that was interesting. You know, it's like, yeah, let's give an award if somebody... Um, did a really good job playing the game and an amazing job painting and stuff like that. Uh, sportsmanship scores, you notice what I just described doesn't have a sportsmanship score. Um, I don't know. I think the purpose of sportsmanship is to reward people for being uh, fun to play against. And I think another way of saying that too is to try to get people thinking about being a fun person to play against. I know there are plenty of times when I don't think about it and, and in hindsight, you know, then I later I think of I'm like I regret it. I'm like, man, why, I was so caught up in trying to win the game that I should have just taken it easier and just laughed and whatever. And some people are especially good at that. And so, in a way, I like sportsmanship scores. It seems to me that that we have um, kind of a handful of people that always win those, which is is kind of cool. Um, with you know, it's consistent. It's not just a one-time popularity contest or something. The award that I think is essential for larger tournaments is the best in race award. I love that. Now the way we do it here is there's no there's no prize support attached to it. You get a cheap certificate. I mean, certificates are almost free. Sometimes they'll do a small one and put it into a, a frame you get at the dollar store for one dollar. And so these words literally cost us one dollar. Uh, I love it. I love it. Love it. Love it. And it's not like I put those things on my wall. But you know, sometimes you have a tournament where <clears throat> you know a couple things didn't go well for you. You're not going to win the tournament. You're probably not going to be in top three. And normally you're like, ah, screw it. Okay, fine. I'll just finish up and just enjoy playing five games against people and that's cool but with best in race that's an extra element you're like wait if there's if i'm playing an army and the people at the top aren't playing that i might win my my best in race award i know over the last several years we have two um tomb kings when because we've been playing you know warhammer fantasy until recently uh that every, it's always a big deal which of them wins the the best in race award for tomb kings and i thought that was really cool you know they at the time that wasn't a really competitive army so they weren't necessarily probably weren't going to win the top table but you know what that's the army they owned that's what they played and they took a lot of pride in, in beating that other guy which i think is fantastic that's of all the words we give that's the one i just think is just essential i don't think it makes sense for a 20 person tournament I mean, it just kind of gets to the point where you know half the people in the room are winning best in race and half of them are only in race but um for anything i don't know especially 40 or more, I, I think it's just essential. I would recommend that for any any tournament organizer. And I think that's the way um, in July I'm co-TOing a tournament, uh, Southern Assault here in, in Durham, North Carolina, uh, late July. Um, and I think what we're going to do is do that. The first through third place is for generalship only. And then we'll give some painting awards and, and other stuff. And... Um, and do a best in race award if we have a certain number of people signed up. And then, you know, I don't like the idea of giving, if we have relatively few prizes, giving them, you know, all that money just to, to a few people. 
but if I felt that I didn't have that many prizes and there was money to, to spare, I would do what, what a Buckeye Battles does, and I would just have a lot of random awards. You know, they have, they have random stuff that they give out. They, they don't do cash prizes, though. They just do stuff. And so they'll just start kind of, they'll say, okay, it's all door prizes now, and they'll just call people's names, and you go up there, and you choose something off the table. I mean, I would do something like that. Um, you know, it's... When I think to TO, I don't, I don't, I don't like to give tons of door prizes, but I appreciate why they do, and I think you know it's something to consider. So one idea that came up is should you have club awards? And that's another thing we do locally. I forgot to mention, is at the end of everything we do, who is the best club? And it, and it's, it's your, um, the position in terms of overall score for your top three players. Uh, so it's not it's not your total score. So the last tournament we had, I thought our our club won it because we, if you added up the the total score for the top three players, we we were the best, um, and we didn't win it. And so I went and looked exactly how they scored it, and yeah, the way they did it was like, you know, it's uh, first place, third place, and fifth place. Then you add up one, three, and five, and you want the lowest score. So I love club awards. It's really fun. It brings a team element to it. I mean. There's, you're always going to have your buddies there that you kind of you hope do well, but now you're really kind of sitting there and you're you're trying to help your your buddy think through his strategy in the next game and stuff like that. And it also, when you play people on a weekly basis, it kind of shifts your focus a little bit. Like you really want them to get better. It's not about like you, you're playing them and you you want to win. You're like no, I want I want us both to do well at the next tournament so our team does well. So uh, you're trying to help each other. Now, be, tournaments that have club awards. Uh, I'll get that in just a second. Um, sometimes when when there are club awards, you have immunity saying, you know, where they say, you know, if you guys sign up and say you're on the same club, then you don't, you won't play each other the first round or the first two rounds or, or I think Buckeye Battles will usually say, we'll try to make it to where you never play each other, but towards the end of the tournament, we may, it we may not have a choice. Um, I really like club immunity because I play these people on a regular basis. I really don't want to play them there, especially if I travel. I mean, I, I get a little bit angry if I travel, if I travel three hours to a tournament and I'm, and if I were matched up round one with my buddy that I play every week, I'm like, this is an expensive game. I want to play people in armies that I don't, I don't usually do. Um, I love immunity. I would do it the way the Buckeye Battles does it. If it were completely up to me, I would say if it's in your club, then you just don't play them. And the only exception is when we get to the end, if you're near the top tables and things weren't really close. Like sometimes scores are close enough that you can just swap a few people around. It's not a big deal. But if there's kind of a gap there and we're like, no, we need to figure out, you know, these, there are awards at stake. Then I might say, yeah, that's fine. Um, no more club immunity. You just play who you play based on the Swedish pairing or the um, Swiss pairing. Um, one of the um, things I noticed, if you don't have immunity, I think this is the reason I like it, is it seems that tournament after tournament, you get the clubs that are vying for best club award, and they and, and they all complain like, oh my gosh, we're, we're playing each other now, we're going to knock each other out of contention. And it does, and it, and it it's just, it's just awkward. Like, I yeah, I want to, I want to beat you, I want to play the game and win, but by doing that, you know, um, it actually, because we're playing each other, we're, it's kind of a lose-lose. Our, our club is not going to do as well. It also... Um, I mean, just playing people late rounds, you know, if you have four people at the top, it really behooves you to have one person throw the game so your other person can get a really, really high score. Um, so you have your fourth player drop down, but that score doesn't matter anyway. And so but you have a really, really high top three. And again, you could look at that and say that's cheating. You can look at it and say that's a viable strategy. Either way, I don't like it. You're forcing people to make tough decisions. So um, I've noticed that the clubs tend to gravitate towards each other um, mid, you know, midway towards the end of the tournament. Because a lot of times, you know, when you play people on a regular basis, you kind of develop similar skill levels. Not that everybody in your club is the same skill, but you have pockets of it. And um, if you have relatively stable, you know, relatively the same skill levels, then towards the end of the tournament, you're, you might be in the same area, so you're playing your buddy. I don't want to play my buddy here. I'll play him every week. So, uh, so should there be club immunity? My, I, yeah, I would give all rounds. Um, if you're manually doing pairings, that would just be a nightmare. But you know, there, there are software programs where you say, you know, you put in your criteria. It has to be somebody this person hasn't played before, and you just you just throw in an extra criteria that um, they can't be in the same club, and then you just eyeball it and just make sure that that um, you know it's still doing what you need the pairings to do. 
All right. Paint scores. So before I get, begin talking about uh, painting scores, I want to I want to give two shout outs. Um, when I think about painting in this hobby, I, I, I come out from my own personal experience, and that is I consider myself somebody with little to no inherent artistic ability, and outside of this hobby, no arts training, nothing. And um, and I'm always really critical of my stuff. And other people look at my, some of my models and like, hey, you're a great painter, and I get it and I appreciate it. Um, I think I'm a really good painter for somebody with no artistic skill whatsoever. <laughs> so I really appreciate um, painting tutorials that are geared towards people that aren't necessarily artists. So I give a shout out to, to um, uh, Vince Venturella's Hobby Cheating series. If you go to his channel and go to playlists, uh, I think it's just fantastic because he, he shows you how to do stuff that doesn't necessarily take skill. Um, and it and he does a lot of stuff that when you're painting a whole army, like I don't have time usually to to spend on one model and it, just a ton of time. I'm trying to paint whole armies and so he shows you a lot of um, fast techniques. There's a new one that I would highly recommend checking out. This is a, a buddy of mine. He, he lives a few hours south of me, but he's at a lot of local tournaments. And his channel name is uh, Miguel Garcia Fernandez. And he only has, I think, four videos up. But he won, I think he won the Best Painted Award at his last tournament. And he made a big deal saying, I painted this basically using um, washes and inks. And... Um, you know, it's a distinctly different approach than what Vince usually talks about. And I and I, I like Vince's approach where you do zenital highlighting and then wash with such a thin coat of paint that it almost might as well be a wash. Um, so he's, you know, Miguel Garcia Fernandez primes everything white and then just uses washes and you get a good technique out of it. So uh, for most of you out there who are kind of like me, um, check the check both of those out. I, they're, they're really, really helpful. All right, so when I think about paint scores, the first thing I'm thinking about is how impactful is painting affecting the awards at the tournament, right? I mean, do you have a best overall and painting's in there? And if painting's in there, what? So that, let's say that, that each game, a person can have 25 battle points. So at the end of a five-game GT, that person may have 125 total battle points, or at least that's the potential, the top potential. But of course, people don't like a few people, you know, crush every game. So let's say the winner is sitting around, I don't know, let's just say 100 battle points. Um, how many points are you going to have painting worth? If you have 100 battle points and 100 painting points, you are hugely skewing that tournament to the good painters. That's one thing to think about. And the second thing is, how spread out are those painting points? Because you can do a, a score to where it's like a, a 0 to 20, but most people are hitting. 16 to 19. So what you're really saying is no matter how many how much it's worth for the overall score it's still there's such a small spread that it's not going to make a big difference. But if you have a a um, if you have a spread that's let's say you know you can get 50 points in painting but you know average painters are going to get a tw score of 25 and so there's a big gap between 25 and 50. Um I don't have a firm suggestion on that yet, but I think that's something really important to consider is what are you trying to accomplish with it? Are you trying to find separation? Are we trying to find ways to spread the scores out more, which sometimes can be really important if you have a 100-person tournament? Um, or are you just trying to encourage people to put a lot of effort in their armies? Um, and you can do that without having an overall... Um, you can have Player's Choice Awards where there really are no points. People just go around voting. And, you know, there's, there's different things like that you can do. Um, so, uh, I've done a lot of paint judging lately, and as if you, most of you should know, I'm an educator, I'm a, I'm a professor, and I do a lot of grading. So I do, I grade, I, I grade, I teach graduate students only, I don't, I don't teach undergrads. Uh, we don't have any tests, it's papers. I grade papers all the time. And it's funny because in education there's kind of this, you know, this spectrum of preferences of do you use a grading rubric? Or do you just uh, give a grade based on your expertise? And there's there are pros and cons, and I I, I do both. I mean, it's just uh, I don't have a I'm unhappy with both to be honest. I, grading is just such a time-consuming thing. Um, but the reason you want to use a rubric, uh, technically, usually formally, you say I use a rubric so that you students know exactly what I'm looking for, so you can do that. 
Well, the problem with that is now you just, you just, you know, smart people will just game the system. And they're like, okay, well, you said to do these things. I did those things. My army might look like crap. My paper may actually be not very deep. You know, it may not be that great. But you know what? They hit all the checklist on the rubric. The real reason, I think, why, people, why educators use rubrics, if they, unless they're forced to, they use it because when they give a grade, you have students to come back and say, hey, you didn't give me, I get this all the time, you didn't give me 100%. What did I do wrong? First off, I'm thinking, you got to be kidding me, really? And now I'm thinking, then I'm thinking, my next thought is, I don't have time. I just spent all this time grading your damn paper. Now I've got to sit down and justify to you why I gave you that grade. And sometimes I want to say, you know, if you want to come in and talk through it, come in and talk through it. But a lot of times just it wasn't that great of writing. It was okay. You did kind of what I asked you to do, but um, read the comments I made, the suggestions I made, and all that is why I gave you a, a less than 100%. And who expects 100% all the time anyway? Well, it's the same thing with paint scores. It, it'd be nice to, as a judge to go around and just let me look at the army and overall, does it does it really speak to me? I mean, is it is it beautiful? Um, I would look for, is it like, is it a fantasy is there a fantasy feel to it, as opposed to like a science fiction feel, which which I don't like if, if, in this game, because I feel this should be a fantasy thing, and a, the immersion is important to me, and all that. Um, but I like just to to um, to see what they did well. I could I could look at one army and say, man, your your choice of colors was astounding. I've seen armies where the skill was okay, but the choice of colors was amazing. I've seen others where the skill that it took to do what they did was far beyond what I could do. But their color choices were really jarring. Like I just, I just don't like it. Well, if you use a rubric, it it doesn't really account for all that. No matter how good how good you make the rubric, it's not going to account for all that. Um, so there's the tension. You know, if you give somebody a, a low paint score and you don't have a rubric to point to, then there's hurt feelings, and you know, you know, Chad just wanted his club to win and crap like that. Um, if you use a rubric, then you're kind of forcing how people paint. I'll give you an example, and it's my biggest complaint about paint scores. Uh, locally, we use the same damn rubric every damn time, um, and a, a lot of points on it come from conversions, because you can get, a, you know, are there basic conversions? You get some points. Are there advanced conversions? And then you get a lot of points if you get the third level, which is like major conversions throughout the whole army. I don't like that. I'm like, I don't Maybe I don't want to do conversions. And ironically, I like doing doing conversions is my favorite part of the hobby, but not army-wide, because usually when I decide I want to play an army, now I'm in a rush to do it. I don't have time to convert the whole army. And why is converting something better than not converting it inherently? Uh, most of my models are Games Workshop models, and I think Games Workshop does a really good job on a lot of the models. They don't need to be converted. They, they have the look I want. And so now I have to make that choice. I have to... I, I get consistently not as high as I would otherwise get with most of my armies because there aren't enough conversions. And that, that to me is just really, really frustrating. And that's just a problem um, because that's what the rubric says. I mean, an alternative to that is to say to the paint judge, are there things this person did to really make their army pop? And one possibility would be conversions, you know, and that, that would be cool. Uh, another one I've seen was uh, there was a rubric for is there seamless blending? And I see you know, seamless blending is really a skill. And I appreciate this was probably like if you want to get the highest points for it. Uh, but I don't know. I mean, I want to say, are there ways to get a really, really nice paint job without there being seamless blending? And maybe that just depends on how you're defining that term. So, um, I don't know. I've, I, there's a rubric I found online uh, that basically just said, you know, here are six categories, and give it give the, the army a, one, a zero through three. So, is it coherent? And I think no matter what you're using, whether it's a rubric or just guidelines, I think coherency is is key. Does it look like an army in the field? Even if that army is supposed to be a ragtag army, that's cool. Does it look like a ragtag army? As opposed to somebody who borrowed a few units from his friend, and the, it looks totally out of place. Like it just doesn't fit together. I think that should always be on there somewhere. Uh, this one, they had, you know, zero to three points for shading, you know, the extent that they did shading well. Um, I like that that doesn't say seamless blending. It's just, you know, that that is a technique that helps you get good shading and, and highlights and stuff. 
um, but it doesn't require that per se. Uh, this one's, you know, zero to three for the details, for standout pieces, which I like, you know, sometimes there's a centerpiece model. I've noticed that I have done so much better over the last year. My paint score, I'm, I've been consistently at the top of local tournaments in my paint scores. And I think that a lot, a lot of that is because I've chosen one, two or three centerpiece models and I put a lot of conversions into them and a lot of love and time into painting them. They're still only as good as I can do them, but they, they but they pop, they stand out, they draw the eye. So I have all these other units around them that if you look closely, you can tell like, yeah, they're okay. I mean, it's just, I mass painted 50 freaking gores, you know, back in the day. Um, but, but because there's a centerpiece model that draws the eye, we get a lot higher, higher points for that. And then this one I was looking at, remember I said there were six areas. Well, the sixth one was totally subjected, subjective, you know, as a paint judge, was there something not already covered that you feel deserves some extra points? And again, I, I mean, I kind of like that. Um, uh, I know a lot of people say, um, you know, if there are unpainted models, then you get a zero for everything, um, which like anything else can be unfair. What if there's one unpainted model? Like, because you forgot, because whatever, you know, there's one. Really, the whole thing is, is gone. Um, you know, we usually do it where you get points, like you get, if it's, if there's any unpainted models, boom, you get zero. Then it's, you get up to four points for, is it at least bare minimum painting? Like it's finger painted, but it's, it's painted. You get four points. Um, then they have what they call standard army, you know, the standard GT skill level. And you can get a couple points. Is it fairly neat painting? A couple more points that there's basic effort put into conversions, shading or basing. And then a couple more points is there a cohesive theme to it? Um, so f what this is geared to do, that means right now you're getting between, what, four and 10 points uh, for a standard GT Army. So then they have well-executed GT Army points. So they must show effort towards making models neat and clean. It can, it can even be dipped, but it has to be highlighted and cleaned up and, and have some kind of blending get a point. Um, are the bases more than just st sand or static grass? Like there's architectural elements or multiple materials or something like that, you get a point. Um, highlighting shading, you get a point if there's a, you know, that's decently done. Large number of conversions, the one I don't like, you get a point. Uh, offered obvious effort put into building a tournament gaming army, another point. So in theory, most of the, most of the ar armies at that tournament won't get these points because most armies are standard. That's kind of what standard means. Uh, so this is trying, whereas everybody else has 12 points, they want the better painters to have 17 points or, you know, up, up towards 17. Then they have another four points available for what they call best in show. And so in theory, if that army doesn't turn your head, it shouldn't be eligible for any of these points. So very high quality shading and highlighting a large number of conversions, green stuff work, stuff like that. Uh, character models painted to a very high standard, which I find odd because that's usually done before the rest of the army's uh, done well. Uh, detailed works on banners, movement trays, thematic elements, stuff like that. And then there's a couple points extras that can be given to any army, you know, like if they'd have some free hand or, or a, a thematic appearance or stuff like that. But you can see the spread there. Is, it's like, you know, you're going to have most people around 12, 13, and then you're going to have people up around 19, 20. And then they multiply that to get to the total number of possible paint points based on whatever. And um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm okay with that. I mean, that's uh, it's just what I'm used to. So sometimes I get tired of it, but that's just because it's, it's all the time. So I think I think what I I like I like um, a rubric that's more guidelines that that still allows for uh, an artist's subjective. Uh, opinion on things. And if you're worried about people, um, you know, not playing it straight and, and, um, and, and judging their own club or their buddies or something like that, you know, then you just get one person from each club doing the judging. And for anybody's score, you throw out the highest and the lowest and you go with the rest. I mean, you know, you can do stuff like that. It's a little more work, but you know, it's manageable. So overall, those are my thoughts on it. I, um, 
I think there's been a trend that, that, that wasn't here five years ago. I, I could be wrong with that, but I think five years and before, you really didn't have best overall being such a strong thing. It was basically general ship, and then they started trying to promote painting more. And now, in my area at least, overall is the award to get. And and certainly that's that's pushed me to try to develop my painting skills and stuff. Um, I don't have a firm opinion yet on whether that's good or bad. I, like I said, in my tournament, we're going to go away from it only because we want to be different. We're going to try something different to see if we like it. And we're going to do it just solely on generalship and then have a separate category for painting and sportsmanship and stuff like that. So we'll see how that goes. So I'm interested in feedback I, I, I um, on anything like this. What I'm thinking is I think there are things that I'm blind to, things I didn't talk about because they're not on my radar, so to speak. So if there are elements to your tournament scoring that uh, I haven't talked about, please leave in the comments and uh, open my eyes to them, and then maybe I'll post a follow-up video.